Hello, my name is Mark Taylor. Welcome to the Education on Fire podcast network. This show is sponsored by the National Association for Primary Education. Hello and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place where we share creative and inspiring learning in our schools. Season 5, episode 72. Hello and welcome back to the Education on Fire podcast with me, Mark Taylor. Today I'm joined by Ryan Ellis and he's the host of the PE Umbrella podcast. And of course, this season we're talking all things sport, all things PE to to give you some insights into into the best way to create the ideal PE lesson, I guess, and and the way to sort of embed it really as part of a, a really successful part of your school. So welcome, Ryan. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, man. Great. So can we start with a bit of background um, in terms of um, your sort of teacher training and then also how you got into the podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So my background uh, as a teacher is I started off coaching. Um, I did an undergrad degree in sport development and PE. So that was my my goal, my passion. I was thinking about becoming a secondary PE teacher. Um, I went on a bit of a journey over to the States during my degree doing some coaching of football. Um, decided I really liked working with some of the younger children between sort of five and 11 years old, which was primary age children, of course. So upon returning, I made the bold decision to train as a primary teacher instead of just a secondary PE teacher. And combining that with my sort of sport and coaching background, became a primary school teacher uh, for three years before dropping into my current role, which is at Sporting Influence in Harrogate here and training teachers, upskilling them in physical education. During that time, of course, I launched the podcast, The PE Umbrella, and I guess that came around because I listened to podcasts an awful lot. I launched in October 2015, so we're not far off three years now, and I really enjoyed listening to other podcasts, which weren't necessarily education-based. They were more about lifestyle or business, so one with the name similar to yours, I don't know if you have heard it, Mark, as well, is Entrepreneur on Fire, Absolutely. On Fire, which is the uh, podcast by John Lee Dumas, I absolutely love that. Um, Pat Flynn, Smart Passive Income, Gary Vaynerchuk, all these podcasts I just loved listening to when I was exercising, going to the gym. And it just dawned upon me on a holiday and I thought, you know what, I don't know of any or many at the time education podcasts, particularly in my area of interest, which was physical education. Perhaps I can launch something along the lines of Entrepreneur on Fire, where I interview PE teachers or experts in the field around the world and get their bits of advice about PE. So their favorite warm ups, their favorite class management strategies to help what I know are primary teachers who struggle with PE because I've always seen it as an area of worry for them and they're not sure where to turn or what to do. So I figured I could fill a void there by launching a podcast. So I, I set to work and two months after I came up with the idea, uh, the P Umbrella podcast launched. That sounds um, an awful lot like me. It's just that kind of wanting to support teachers out there that you know are struggling or no need a little bit of extra help, but they don't quite know where to turn to. And so I think the podcast is a fantastic medium. Like you said, whether you're at the gym, whether you're on the school run, when you're taking a dog for a walk, you know, you can get all this extra information and, and support in, in, in a way that's not even more time consuming that you'd actually be doing something else. And I think that's obviously the, the, the beauty of the podcast. Yeah, of course. And that was exactly the reason I launched it. In my head, I had the perfect picture of a teacher on the on the drive to school on a morning listening tuning in just for 10 minutes listening to a bit of an episode of the p umbrella hearing a warm up they like or hearing just a snippet of information that they could implement in their own teaching or they found useful to help them so uh, i think it's done that so far 105 episodes in and, and still going strong Great. And, and what's your, your general thoughts about physical education in schools? And um, I know from my perspective as, as a parent, you know, there's um, some of the class teachers that have to do sport in school and PE in school. Um, but there's also quite a lot of external companies that come in, not necessarily during the school day, but certainly before and after school. Um, so I'm interested in, in your thoughts about how that all sort of fits into the fabric of the, of the whole sort of learning experience. Well for, well, for me, you know, it's giving you my opinion, I always wear my heart on my sleeve. And, and for me, if, if I had that power in a school, I'm returning to classroom teaching in September and I'm going to get more of the reins on the PE there. Part of the cornerstone of what I think, you know, builds the makeup of a very good, outstanding school with, with healthy individuals, healthy children, healthy staff. Um, and that's physically and mentally, um, which is becoming ever more prevalent. Um, I think quality PE can be taught by any teacher it doesn't have to be a PE specialist although I know 
and I'm aware there are more PE specialists now, which I think is a fantastic idea. Uh, my son's school has uh, just a designated PE teacher teaching all the PE, and, and she's wonderful and does a fantastic job. But I know that's not feasible for all schools' funding reasons, and it, it might go down that route. But all teachers can teach quality PE, but what they're lacking at the moment is a significant training and upskilling on knowledge. And if they come from a, a background or a lifestyle where they haven't valued physical education or physical activity and haven't maybe played, and I'm going to say sport, sort of in parentheses here, people get confused physical education and sport. They're two completely different things. They worry about teaching it. Um, it certainly got a place. You mentioned external coaches coming in and Again, I think that's a good thing before and after school. Absolutely. To specialize in particular areas so children can sign up to sports they might be interested in or physical activities. I do know many schools employ coaching companies to come in and teach lessons as well for um, PPA cover. Now, we may talk about funding later, but it does state in the funding it should not be used for PPA cover. And I know many schools still do spend it on that because at the end of the day, the funding is going to disappear at some point. No, no mistake about it. It probably will dry up. And if we're not using it in the right way, our teachers are going to be left high and dry, having gained or harnessed no new ideas. Um, coaches can be great. They can be fantastic and specialised in areas that they're good at. But for me, teachers have a, a slightly different skill set. Sometimes it's more pastoral. They know their class better because they teach them day in, day out, lesson in, lesson out. And it's sometimes those relationships which are the very fabric and foundation of what is quality PE, in my opinion. And in terms of the curriculum and, and, and what you have to cover in PE, can you cover a little bit about you know what's needed in terms of what you have to do and also just some PE related, I don't know whether it's games or that sort of thing, which just build up the children's understanding or coordination and, and that kind of thing. I'm sort of just sort of relating this back to sort of myself as a musician. You know, there, there are certain things that you would actually cover because it's deemed to be something that you're supposed to cover. But yeah. certain, certainly as a, you know, as a, as a rhythm uh, um, person, as a drummer, you know, there's all sorts of rhythm games and that I do all the time just because it really just embeds a general musicality in them I guess that must be the same from a sport point of view yes I mean there is still a, a debate in, in physical education circles about what primary PE should be whether it should be sport based units and we're doing football tag rugby hockey or whether it should be skill based now I'm more so in the skill based camp so let's take key stage one for example we're all about building fundamentals. And when I say fundamentals, I'm talking about locomotion, different ways of moving. I'm talking about stability. And I'm talking about object control. Now, I very rarely, if ever, in a key stage one setting, will do that through focused sport-specific games. So I won't say we are doing hockey today. So take locomotion. We're just going to be working on ways they can move their bodies and they're comfortable in moving their bodies, whether that be walking, walking backwards, jogging, sidestepping, hopping, using obstacles and things on the floor, poly spots, cones, lines, and being able to be you know, aware of our bodies, of the children's bodies, and how they can move safely and efficiently elements of stability, balancing on one leg, transferring to the other one. Are they able to stand still with their arm out to the side and hold a beanbag on it? Create Development have got their real PE, which is a scheme of work, which I know is very popular, which certainly hones in on those fundamentals. And going towards key stage two, I go for a more broad look at the curriculum. So again, instead of sport specific, I will look at areas of learning. So invasion games, which may cover elements of hockey, basketball, football. So we're not honing on one particular skill. We're looking at a range of skills that can be applied in different sports should the children wish to do so. We may look at net and wall games, striking and fielding games, orienteering. All of these areas bring in more than simply the physical. And I think that's where people get caught up, that it isn't just the physical aspects we should be looking at. We should be looking at the cognitive side we should be looking at the social elements in physical education the affective domain and how it makes the children feel when they win when they lose how they feel when they've been exercising and what changes are happening to them so you by no means have to be that expert in the physical to teach it but for me it's a broad and balanced curriculum looking at the, the whole round holistic development of the child so Going back to what you mentioned about the very fundamentals that should be in place at key stage one, for me, it is absolutely those three things. I'll say them again. Locomotion, 
object control and stability. And if you look at the guidance for what the government expects children to be able to do at the end of key stage one, I think there's like four bullet points which mention those key terms I've just talked about. And there's no no more depth than four bullet points. So teachers have got really a, a free reign to do whatever they wish with that um, as long as they hit those areas. It seems to me, I mean, I mean, having not taught um, PE in school at all, just listening to what you were saying, I can kind of start to imagine how you would then be able to structure a, a terms lesson or a year's lesson um, around those things. Because they, like I said, it sounds like there's those building blocks which actually just then lead on to the next thing that you could do. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'll give you an example. When I'm teaching Key Stage 1 PE, um, EYFS Year 1, even up to Year 2, I'll do a lot of my lessons through theme storytelling. So rather than it being we are learning this skill today, I'll disguise it in a story. So today we're going to be knights in the kingdom and we're going to protect our castle. But before we can do that, the king has to see that we're able to be worthy of serving under his kingdom as, as a knight. So we're going to have a knight's duel. And I'll explain to them that they need to have a bib tucked into the side of their shorts. And they're simply going to play 1v1 around a cone on the floor. And they've got to steal each other's bib, which is their knight's belt. And they're playing a little dodging invasion game, but they're trying to impress the king, which would be me, the teacher. And they buy into this story. So a game like that, the knight duel game, trying to steal their bib, unknowingly they're working on their agility, their their locomotion and how they move, their dodging. We're working on the social skills by encouraging them to high five and congratulate their partner, whether they win or lose the round. The emotional side, we have a little discussion after that game. How did it feel when you lost your bib? How did you react? Were you sad? Were you angry? Were you okay with it? And all of these things, observing as a teacher, I'm able to pick out individual traits in the children, which helps me build those relationships up better with them. And I think another misconception is that you have to always reinvent the wheel. And let's not forget here, teachers may be thinking now, well, how could I have a different theme every week or every session of the year? Well, you don't because you can repeat the same skills over and over, over, sorry, in the same context or in a brand new context. Because take, for example, phonics or times tables in the classroom. It's something many classes, students, they, they do day in day out but in a different context whether it's times tables rock stars or a game the teachers made up or whether it's on a piece of paper they're repeating these fundamentals over and over for instant recall facts whether rightly or wrongly and same with their phonics physical skills are no different their locomotion their object manipulation and stability need to be repeated so there's no worry about doing the same lesson over and you wouldn't believe the amount of times i've been in schools i've already taught these games and these lessons in and they just want to do it again. They want to go on the same story and the same journey. Yeah, it, become, it becomes part of the fabric of their learning, doesn't it? And like you say, um, PE is not every day necessarily in primary schools. Yeah. And so actually, well, it might feel like you're doing the same thing. Actually, there's probably a week or certainly a few days between each session. And, and so actually that sort of familiarity and coming back to it, that, that there's an awful lot of um, positivity in doing it that way. No, there is, of course, and the children thrive in that. It's familiar territory, it's habit. And I would argue that whilst PE isn't every day, of course, from my bias, my point of view, it should be. But, you know, the initiatives like the Daily Mile are being brought in. Again, I I think it's a good idea, but I think there's better ways to do it. Um, You know, does it have to be running? Could children come in? If they're doing Daily Mile each day, could some children choose to have a beanbag or a tennis ball and practice throwing and catching it in the air? Certain soft skills, could they throw it with a partner? Could they just have something else to do other than running a mile? And I think that would all compound and contribute to to building children who are more physically literate and sort of along that front I mean would you you said you know do PE every day I mean I, I agree I think there are certain things that should be done in the same way as they have to do the phonics and, and the mass and all that sort of thing um but like you say <laughs> that, that's a different conversation yes um um but but if, if that was the case if you had a magic wand and, and you were going to be able to create that you know we're going to start each day or at a certain point during the day we're going to be able to do PE what what do you think you'd actually make that look like what would that sort of um sort of envisions be for you would be a whole variety of things. I don't think it would stick with one thing, but physical education, I think the active part is the most important as it being daily, you know, keeping our children fit, healthy and active. So that's why I love initiatives which are, which are coming in. Like I say, the daily mile is good, but I think can be tweaked, even if it's active learning. And there's so many great things out there now with maths of the day, with Tagtivate, 
It doesn't have to be physical education standalone. We are looking at object manipulation today. It might be an active maths session for an hour, which we could class as being under the PE bracket with some maths in there or some literacy as well, whether it's some more yoga or mindfulness based things. So we're getting aware of, of our bodies and how our bodies move. So I think I would try and make it very varied. I would try and have the children really working on the, the soft fundamental skills I mentioned for key stage one and becoming more competent in those areas. I mean, on my podcast, having chatted with teachers from primary right through to secondary, the, the one concern and worry from secondary teachers is children are coming to secondary school and they lack what they would consider and what I consider to be very basic skills, such as being able to catch an object or being able to throw accurately with good weight, which I think everyone should be entitled to be able to do, particularly by 11 years old, for sure. Um, that being said, uh, a recent podcast I did, the, the thing which was glaringly obvious is that above all that, I want the children when they leave primary school to be engaged and enthused with physical education. So they want to do it in secondary, regardless of their ability and how good they are at throwing, catching, running, jumping. If they're engaged and enjoy it, they can develop those skills as they go through secondary school. So I think d d daily PE will take away the stigma that it's something which you've got to choose to like or not. And I think all the foundation subjects have got this same sort of stigma around them. Children will get their opinions from home, from friends, that their parents didn't like PE. If their teacher wasn't very good, so we don't like PE. Maybe they're not active outside of school. So their opinions are almost spoon fed to them and formed and only doing it once or twice a week. Sometimes it's a tough nut to crack think if we did it daily i feel then we'd be able to drive that message home and have all of our children enjoying and loving being physically active and, and certainly that whole cross-curricular idea isn't it it's not that we're going to take an hour out of our day to do pe now like you said no, you, know, you know you you just combine it with all of those things and then it just becomes part and parcel of their life which i guess is probably the most important thing that you know moving and and being active is actually something we want our children to be doing all the time Exactly. And it, it frustrates me when the opinions of some is that PE is just games. I mean, they say, oh, it's taking an hour out of something else. Well, it's not. I would argue that that hour is, is enhancing on what could have been there instead and making it even better. It's not that we're going to do PE for an hour, which involves doing a warm up and then playing a game such as, here we go, let's throw a ball out and play bench ball. You know, that's horrendous practice. But it's more about if you as a practitioner, as a teacher, when delivering PE can tap into those different domains of learning there's so much can be harnessed from something so simple even if it was for example bench ball i'll use that bad element of practice again but if the, the practitioner switched on you can really focus on the the emotional aspects of that or the social aspects and really get some children to develop in different ways than just the physical which is which is why i think pe should be done more often because yes physical is almost the byproduct which we do want them to learn but there's a lot more to it than that and for those teachers who really are um, inexperienced in terms of having learnt the basics of how to teach PE um, or feel slightly nervous about mm -hmm. doing it, um, what advice would you give them just as, as a kind of, if you need to do, this is your first term and you need yeah. to start doing it, you know, wh where would you start? What, what advice would you give them? Well, first and foremost, treat PE like any other lesson you would do. And I know teachers get flustered sometimes because they're not in the comfort of their classroom. They'll be in a hall or on the playground or the field. And I was always told, treat the hall and the playground as your field as an extension of your classroom. Your expectations, first and foremost, for the way the children act, behave, is exactly the same. Consistency is absolutely key. On top of that, if they aren't particularly again, sporty or they don't like pee themselves, I think it definitely shows in a teacher you've as a teacher, you've got to put on the show. You've got to put on the best show of your life to engage and enthuse children you're teaching. So whether you like it or not, show the children that you do care and that you enjoy it. That will immediately give you an advantage with the children. They feed off of your energy. And thirdly, you don't have to be an expert in anything to teach quality PE. My advice would be demonstrate as much as you physically feel like you can do. Use the children to your advantage. They're more than happy to demonstrate. They want to be the center of attention oftentimes to show a skill. And if you are demonstrating and get something wrong, it is not the end of the world. At the end of the day, we want to demonstrate to children it's okay, things don't always go right. We want to demonstrate to them a growth mindset and be persistent. And I've said this many times on my, poc on my own podcast that when I'm demonstrating now, I'll purposely do things wrong. And 
I'll want to see if the children call me out on it or I'll, I'll miss a catch or I'll, I'll do a wonky throw because I want the children to see it's OK for me to fail because it makes them feel better about themselves. Then if they do make a mistake, it's no use of them seeing me being perfect to everything I do, even though I've had years of experience at it. They want to see that I can cope with getting things wrong as well. So those are the three things I would say. Treat the, the classroom like you would in any other session you do. I would absolutely say don't be afraid to get things wrong for sure. And on your website um, for the podcast, you've got all manner of resources and things there. Mm. So w what sort of things can people um, find there if they, if they go and check out the podcast? So, yeah, of course, on, on the website, there's the podcast itself, which is 105 episodes. And I would say that is the best resource you could go to is the podcast. So if you've listened to some of the episodes, I've interviewed some some world class PE teachers around the world from the States, from Australia, from here in the UK who really know what they're talking about. And they always share their top warm ups, their favorite class management strategies. You know, it's all crammed into there. Oftentimes they'll share their worst moments. They'll tell us about the story of the worst P lesson they've ever had and why it was such a shambles, but actually how they bounced back and came out the other side. In terms of physical resources, if you want to delve into that, there are activities, self-guided progressions and some assessment stuff, which I find useful for primary PE. So activities has a few little games on there. This is all free that you can have a look at and try with your class if you wanted to do a one-off, have a bit of fun. Self-guided progressions is based really around the premise of gamification, which I think is huge in education now, which includes the children leveling up or trying to learn at their own pace, if you like, in a variety of areas. So, for example, I have a, a Mr. Ellis's ball skills challenge. There's level one through till five. It's like a color coded rainbow. The children start on level one and it just gives them 10 minutes of, of free play and experimentation where they can try and work through the levels at their own pace. So rather than being a teacher directed, it's student led, which I think is very useful. So you'll find lots of self guided progressions on there. And then, of course, there's some assessment based practices on there, too, for reflecting at the end of sessions on their performance exit ticket posters so i base a lot of my learning around i can statements so i've got these posters one of them says i can't do this yet one of them says i can sometimes do it another one says i can do it most of the time and another one says i can always do this so i have these up in my school hall or outside and when the children leave at the end of my lesson i have them high five or tap one of the posters almost to acknowledge how they've got on at the particular objective for the day and it's a good way for me to see how they rate themselves and what I need to continue working on. So whole heap of stuff there. And the recent edition of the Umbrella Shop has some more in-depth schemes of work. There's a small cost on there, but we've got 60 page PDF documents. There's a EYFS year one scheme of work. There is a year five, six athletic scheme of work and a year three, four invasion games, full scheme of work on there, which has lesson plans, activity cards, posters, assessment, all crammed in. That sounds fantastic. And and you just sort of touched on there in terms of actually acknowledging where you are in the process. And I really love that, you know, the, the kind of I can do it, I'm getting there, mm. I can do it sometimes. I mean, what's your thought about um, the, the winning and losing aspect of sport? I mean, for example, my um, my daughter's in year six, so she's just coming to the end of her primary school. In their sports, they went from a traditional sports day of um, normal races and all of that sort of thing to a fully inclusive, everyone's doing lots of things all the time. Yeah. And, and over the course, of you know everyone registering what they did and someone did or didn't do better than others but it's not the same as we're running from yeah. the length of the field and someone's going to win and someone's coming up so what's what's your thought on that sort of take that everyone needs to be doing everything all the time kind of idea no, well it's a fine line to toe isn't it i mean i i i'm very much of the impression that competition is good winning and losing is absolutely great but it has to be managed and children have to go through the struggles and accept winning and losing for me PE is sometimes the only subject some children have to shine and that's their moment and I'm not a big fan of taking away from that because some other children can't accept winning and losing you play games in the classroom in your other subjects where you'll have people who perform better than others so why not in physical education I like the sports days that are more balanced now where there are some multi-skills carousels where we all have a turn we all have a go score points for our house team but i very very much still think there should be the competitive element of races in there too who's the fastest in this year group who's the best at the sack race i think that's fantastic and why would we deprive the children of that experience to to manage their emotions and this is why in pe when i teach it it's such an important aspect sometimes my learning objective for a session 
might focus entirely on the emotional aspect about today we're doing some skills we're doing some dribbling of our hockey ball for example but we're going to be today i can manage my emotions when i get tackled and that's going to be my entire focus on that session how did it make you feel what can you do if you get cross or angry how can you respond how can you channel that energy for the better because quite frankly and i say this all the time these children are going to grow up through primary school through secondary school and they're going to be entering a world very much where you're striving to win and do the best you can there isn't trophies and medals for everybody and that's the opinion i hold so i do like the competition i understand why they try and make it more inclusive because we don't want to put children off pe but for me a one-off sports day isn't where children are getting put off pe and physical activity that stems from the attitudes towards it at home and the pe lessons that they should be having at least once or twice a week that's where we can really impact them so the one-off sports day competition for me shouldn't have the negative impact it sometimes does yeah, no, that, that makes an awful lot of sense. Um, and a little bit earlier, we talked about, about the funding aspect of all these things. Um, can you um, go into that just a little bit before we finish, just in terms of, I know there is funding out there for schools to gain access for some of these things, and I'm not sure that people always necessarily know that's the case. Yeah, of course. I mean, the best the best place I've been to, to recently sort of check on what the funding is, it's been around for a number of years now. Each year, schools are given a grant of money to spend on physical education. The best place I found to go to look into this is on the Association for PE website, AFPE. Anybody who's not aware of that website, because they're maybe not into that PE aspect, so it's www.afpe.org.uk. You can look about the funding on there. It tells you what you must spend it on, what they're looking for, why you should be showing this spending on your website. And for me, the funding, as I mentioned earlier, should not be spent on PPA cover, but on something that's going to enhance the, I say the, the stature of physical education in your school and provide better quality physical education, whether that is upskilling staff, whether that is putting on extra clubs for the children and opportunities in competitions, whether that is buying in extra planning, which you know staff find it easier to follow. I know a lot of schools have done that. That's all a good use of the spend, in my opinion. Um, and it's, it's looking to to continue and stay around the funding. So I think it's something like 2020 now. Um, but yeah, I jump on the AFP website and certainly any PE coordinators who may be listening or even primary teachers who feel their school doesn't really know what to do with the funding guide their head teacher jump on themselves and, and take this website to their school and say look here's a, a really good example laid out of how we can spend this money how much we've got and how we can help our students um just to add to that one more thing i think is essential is just to take stock of what you've got in your equipment cupboard there's nothing worse and i understand this from any teacher's perspective you're going to teach pe and you want to do some ball skills and there's a bag of 12 balls and you've got 30 kids we wouldn't expect children to practice their handwriting or anything uh, there with one pencil between three we, at all we just wouldn't so when we're learning fundamental physical skills make sure you're well stocked with the equipment you know you've got a lot of money there to spend on it and there's no excuses now especially into the third or fourth year of the funding to have a well stocked physical education cupboard which has got wonderful resources in it no, that's some um, great advice there, and I, and I think you're right. And it also just also sends the message that this is an integral part of your learning, isn't it? Because, like you say, you wouldn't have not enough pencils for the pe- for the children to be doing other work. So why would you? Yes. Why would you not have all everything you need to do a PE lesson? I mean, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. I think first impression. Well, sometimes first impressions, but how you present what you're teaching to the children is key so if you've got a pristine classroom pencils there you've got your colors you've got your sharpness whiteboard is all spot on for your lessons in the classroom but then you head out and do pe and you drag in an old bag of footballs and cones that are all over the place and dirty muddy x y and z the children see that and just think oh this is this almost looks like a, a secondary subject it's just bolted on the teachers don't really care about it and they're not sure what's going on so take pride in that and I think that in itself can be it can be a booster to some of the children. Absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate your time and, and all that great insights that you've given us over the last sort of half an hour or so. So let's finish off. Um, tell us um, exactly where we can listen to the podcast and, and where we can get as much information from you as we can. 
For sure, yeah. So, like I said before, the podcast is a wealth of information. That's the first port of call I would go to for any sort of golden nuggets or knowledge bombs, as I might say, of information to do with PE. So, the website is www.peumbrella.com. Have a little browse around there. You can listen to the episodes on there with the show notes or on iTunes, which is the the, the main port of call for the PE Umbrella podcast. Um, there is a way you can keep in touch with me on Twitter, which is my Twitter handle, at Ryan Sporting. And that's where much of my P Umbrella themed work gets posted out. And also a Facebook page and group as well, which is simply the PE Umbrella. That's great. Um, lovely. I really enjoyed um, chatting today. And, and I certainly, as a, as a non-PE specialist, have now got a much better idea of how I would be able to do it. And so I hope teachers also who've got much more skill than me in terms of doing that will actually feel a bit more confident in um, in where, where they'd like to take their PE lessons. And I think that's um, that's all we can really do. For sure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And just one more thing before I go, anybody who's feeling unsure, Twitter has been the absolute peak of professional development for me in physical education still so hashtags such as hashtag phys ed hashtag pe geeks if you search that there is so much wonderful content from amazing practitioners around the world you are sure to find something that will help you out fantastic many thanks ryan thank you very much mike appreciate it thanks for listening to the education on fire podcast for more information of each episode and to get in touch go to educationonfire.com Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.